Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Jesus, for uh, bringing us together this evening to uh, you know, grow closer to you and sharing our faith and, and learning more uh, about uh, uh, the story about the woman at the well and, and uh, the story about uh, conversion and repentance. And, and may uh, a special way Herb be guided by the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. And may we, uh, we learn uh, through him and we ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, like I said, bear with me. This was new to me, and as it was new to me, I figure it's it could possibly be new to everybody else. And what, uh, as I'm reading it, it uh, spoke about Jesus traveling from Judea to Galilee and going through Samaria. And I wanted to have an idea of what the geography was like. A Galilee would be on the top, and on the bottom, and Samaria in between. The River Jordan runs alongside of these three pieces, and it's Palestine. The country of Assyria would be on the opposite side of the Jordan River, which would be, as you're looking at it, toward the right of Palestine. And around 700 BC, the Assyrians traveled, and the Assyrians settled in Samaria. Some of the Samarians settled in uh, Assyria, so you had a mix of cultures which created a mix of religions. Back then, the uh, Judaism would be the prime religion, but uh, the Assyrians accepted Moses' teachings, but they ignored the prophets, and they kind of shaped the religion to fit their needs, what they needed at the time. So uh, normally, if a Jew was going to Galilee from Judea, they normally didn't travel through Samaria. They would normally travel around. Jesus chose to walk through Samaria. He was walking. It was a midday. It was hot. It was noon. And he stopped at a well. Apparently, back then, the wells were the center of town. People would meet at the wells. People would go to the wells. But this is midday. Normally, midday in the heat, you would not have as many people out as you would have early morning and sort of the evening. So he stopped at the well, and he was looking for a drink of water. A Sumerian woman walked up to the well to fill her jug with water. A Sumerian woman walking in the midday heat, the reason she was walking was she considered herself a sinner. She had five husbands. She had not followed the teachings of the Lord, and she had not done as, as the Bible asks us to do. During that period, a woman was less of a person than a man. That was just the way things were back then. So she was avoiding people by going to the well in mid-afternoon. Uh, I passed out a paper. Can somebody read John 4, 4 to 8? Anybody wants to? Please do, Jeff. He had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. Did I say that right? Sychar, yes. Sychar. Near the plot of land that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well, uh, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down there at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So the disciples that he was traveling with at that point, and John was one, this is coming from the book of John, uh, had left to go to town to get food. Jesus was alone at the well when the woman came up. Uh, he asked the woman, a Samarian, uh, for a drink of water. Well, normally Jews and Sumerians back then didn't mix. They figured that the Sumerians were not up to the standard. Again, it's back in the day. Uh, they, they had a lower social standard. So she was astonished that Jesus had asked her for water. Uh, somebody want to do John 4, 9 through 12? Please do. The Samaritan woman said to him, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? 
for Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you only if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you do not even have a bucket, and the well is deep. Where then can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself with his children and his flocks? Well, as uh, as it's been going over, I've been going over before with baptism. Water has a big significance in the Bible. Anybody want to remind us what the significance is? Purify the purification. Well, you had a situation now where. Jesus walked up and asked to share water with somebody who wouldn't normally share water. And she's astonished at this point that Jesus was even speaking to her. And if you go into 9 to 12, if you go into uh, 11, John 4, 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. When, then, can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? So if you take a look at it, the woman at the well not recognizing that Jesus was Jesus, made fun of him, said some things that might have been considered unkind, but just pressed him in a way that you wouldn't if you realized it was your Savior. Uh, the, the whole story is a metaphor, and it's a metaphor about earthly, pay, uh, earthly pleasures and uh, how an earthly pleasure needs to be replenished and replenished, but uh, a spiritual peace comes from within and comes from God. There, I was looking up a uh, venerable bishop, Fulton Sheen, had a quote that fits this really well, talking about water rises no higher than its source. If your pleasures are from the earth, they will always be earthly, but the fountain that I give comes from heaven, and once it is in your soul, it causes a sweet compulsion that draws you back to heaven again. And I thought that was a great line, especially for this story. So Jesus answered, John 4, 13 through 15, said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So the woman looked at him and said, Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. So before she got her water, Jesus looked at her and said, Go call your husband and come back. Well, the woman had had five husbands, and I believe in the biblical sense they probably weren't married, but she had five husbands, quote unquote. So Jesus said to her, Call your husband and come back. The woman answered her, him and said, I don't have a husband. So Jesus, taking her own words, said, You're right. You do not have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you said is true. Why do you think Jesus asked about her husbands? Why do you think Jesus went into her personal life for the conversation? Try to help her realize who he is while at the same time try to help her understand where she is in her life. Right. And also, if you think about confession, she actually did her confession with her own words by stating that she did not have a husband, knowing that she had had the relationships. Uh, it was a candid dialogue that Jesus had with her, but it was also a confession from her. And uh, it was to make her realize that she needs to confess and change her life to obtain the war and to obtain grace. Uh, he doesn't condemn her at all for this. Like I said before, he uses her statement to, uh, to, make, uh, to make her realize what she's been through her life and as a confession. So what would you do if you had somebody say that to you and know more about you than the average person would? It's simple. She changed the subject. Her next uh, line to her was, uh, her next line to him was, Jesus, sir, I see that you are a prophet. 
so she totally veered away from the talk of her past. She then figured as a prophet at the time Samaria had created a mountain to worship on and the Jews were using Jerusalem. So she said to Jesus, but you people say that the place to worship is Jerusalem. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, which is right. So Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship your father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Your people worship what you do not understand. We worship what we understand because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. And indeed the father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship worship in spirit and truth. So the point is, again, with the water representing the cleansing and the confession, that Jesus is telling her that more exists in the world than the material, the personal, the uh, earthly pleasures. So she slowly realized that Jesus is not just a man. Uh, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus looks at her and says, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Now you can imagine exactly how she felt at that point. Her spirit was enlightened. She knew what it meant to be freely taken of the water of life. Uh, not only was she impressed that Jesus knew all her sins, but she was also given the opportunity to have the sins forgiven. So she repented her past misdeeds and went back to her city to tell everybody in the city. Very symbolic in the Bible, she leaves her jug behind. So instead of her bringing the water from the well back with her, she's bringing Jesus' water back. Uh, somebody want to take John 4, 39, 42? Many of the Samaritans of the town began to believe in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me everything I have done. When the Samaritans came to him, they invited him to stay, uh, they invited him to stay with him, uh, and he stayed there two days. Many more began to believe in him because of his words, uh, because of his word, and they said to who? To the woman. We no longer believe because of your word, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Which is interesting. Jesus spent two days with the Sumerians, and uh, what's interesting is, again, even though the woman bore witness, the woman was a second-class citizen back in the day due to her being a woman, and uh, probably the entire town knew of her of her past and of her background, and uh, again, you can see they, they didn't believe her for the word, they believed her for Jesus, they came because of her word. So Jesus at that point was spreading the gospel. Uh, the biggest thing that I found in the story was the fact that it's talking about moving away from the earthly pleasures, moving away from the five husbands, uh, being able to confess your sin, which goes back to confession, and uh, being relieved of your sin through, through Christ. Every faith teaches and believes that God forgives sin and that repention, repentance is always possible. Jewish Feast of Yom Kippur, Islam's Ramadan are repentant times, but we've got our, our uh, baptism, confirmation, communion that brings us through and instructs us on, on our faith and the repentance and the uh, confession. Please, uh, Jesus knows everything, correct? I mean, that's what we think, right? Jesus knows everything. So Jesus knew that he was going to meet, uh, meet this lady at the well before he met the lady at the well, right? This wasn't a chance meeting. It was Jesus had, you know, 
kind of had it set up, right? I mean, I believe that, everything that Jesus did was part of the divine plan. Well, but she, okay. she, uh, she had to assent. She had to accept that assent to uh, to, to Jesus. So, uh, and uh, and that's that, you know. And we can reject the divine plan, but she could have as well. The free freedom of choice is there. We choose to. So, so what, what I noticed that this, this, this parallels with the story of the man born blind in terms of the same kind of progression of, uh, of faith from uh, characterizing Jesus as a man and then characterizing him as a prophet and then seeing him as the son of God. So that, there's that kind of same, same progression in both of those stories. So, so what strikes me about this is that you know, we are... Uh, our whole, our whole life is a progression and is a journey of faith. Because if you think, if you think about, uh, we we are kind of how, you know, twenty or thirty years, assuming you're that old, you know, but, or more. Uh, what was your how did what kind of what what was your relationship with Jesus, and how does it differ today? Now, if it hasn't changed, then that then that says something, right? But uh, so, who, who maybe would like to share? You know, if you if you guy cut your life in half, however old you are, and look at your relationship with Jesus, half a lifetime ago to where you are now, would anyone like to characterize their how how that might have changed or? Well, I th I think that I'm doing better. But it may not be for like a super good reason. It's just that I'm getting older, and I'm getting afraid that 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 my time is you know coming you know close. I want to try to uh, like Father Nolan said, I'm trying to you know make sure that I clean my clean up my my act before I do die, so that maybe uh, you know maybe I'll get to heaven if po you know possible. You know uh, so. I think it's a lot, a lot has to do with uh, I'm getting older and I'm thinking well I'm not getting any younger so I try I'm, you know I, I I'm trying to be better but that way as I get older so um, yeah, yeah I if you were to look at me 30 years ago God and Christ was always in the background but was never in the forefront and I owe God and I owe it to myself to find out more about God and more about Jesus. So my life has definitely changed in the last 30 years. Yeah, I, 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 there was something in a book, that, I mean, an eighth grade book, I don't know. Sometimes when you're younger, you feel like you're invincible. I, I was your age one time, your guy, you know, you know, your guy's age, and I felt like, well, I don't, I don't need God as much, you know, I, I, um, you know, now since I had some illnesses, you feel vulnerable and you say, well, you know, I need you, God, I, I, you know, I tried it without you and I'm not making it, and now, you know, now, now's the time to, uh, you know, you know, put, like Lori said, put your problems at the foot of the cross and, uh, you know, and, and that's what I kind of try to do, but you still you get scared sometimes, right? And, and even though even though you believe in God, you still get scared. When you're younger, you're not you're not as you're not as you're not as scared. I I wasn't as scared, so that's so. So the the other point is when when you have an encounter with Christ, you are never the same. That's true. Uh, and if you think about this woman here, what well, she was. And uh, in fact, you, you, you could be if you transformed, and so so you and that those encounters can take on different, you know, different uh, forms, right? It may be through through uh, people that we we know that we encounter Christ, or people, uh, or, or or would anyone like to to share their their own encounter with Christ and how it may have changed you? Well, I could just say that, um, you know, when I found God, I came back full barrel, 100%. I was always on a high. I, I came back through um, healing, 
seeing people get healed. You know, people were laying hands and people praying with people and people were healing. So I knew that God was real. And then, um, you know, just everything. People I saw, the Christian people, one guy, uh, he was in a prayer group, and um, he said uh, he was going to close, he owned a hardware store, he was going to close the store on Sunday. And um, he was just a very Christian person to me. He gave his, uh, his uh, gloves to somebody one day when they were uh, walking home and they didn't have gloves. So I was just like always on a high. So I know what that and I was always seeing God somehow. Um, I was in prayer groups and, and you know, availing myself to a lot of stuff. So it, it definitely stays with you and changes you. Yeah, but what, what, what about the, the negative part? Like when somebody dies that's not supposed to die. Right? We, uh, Lori just said some really good things that, that happened, right? But your personal, you know, she died. Mm -hmm. uh, like she wasn't supposed to die, and it, and she helped Lori, what transfer her life, right, that, right? Or that was her spiritual director. Mm -hmm. Okay, and but she died. She got hit by a car. She just walked out, and boom, dead. I, it's hard to explain. You know, it's hard to explain that to somebody that doesn't have a lot of faith. I mean, you know, doesn't have a lot of faith, right? If somebody dear to you passes away. What do you say? If I remember correctly, when we first started coming here, this topic was had been mentioned in a certain way in the book we were supposed to be reading. And it pretty much said that scenarios like that isn't a matter of God's will as much it's a matter of freedom of will. Uh, we make people make decisions, and sometimes those decisions uh, aren't always resulting with the best form of results. The driver made the decision to drive in however fashion that they were driving. I don't know any details. But for whatever reason, the driver didn't notice uh, the person across the street. Or for whatever reason, the person decided to cross the street. And maybe there was an oncoming traffic. We don't, I don't know, like I said. But there was a, someone made some form of decision that ultimately led to that. And that's not that's not so much God saying, okay, this was your time to go, as much as it was our, our free will. And it's pretty much the book. Well, no, I, I, I mean, I, remember, I can remember you, the, the, I remember you saying something to my, to my statement. You, you did just like you, you did it like, like now. Um, but I, I just find it really hard to, you know, to grasp well. You know, it, it just, you know, it, it happens. You know, that, what, what can you say? God, God lets it happen, but, but it's hard well, to... Well, I mean, there's a couple things. One, one is, yes, God is God and can do anything he's want, He wants, right? And he, he permits he permits things, And but, but we know that, you know, Romans 8, 28 says, you know, for those who love God, he's always working for our good in some way, whether we, we know or see that or not, but the other thing is, it, it's you know we are to be constantly prepared because we you know, we know not the day or the hour, right? So, so, so we we do not put off conversion or, or changing uh, till tomorrow, right? I mean, there's 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 a sense of urgency to uh, to reform our lives, and that you know this is what Lent is all about. So, so you know, are we ready, right? So what, uh, yes, God to all eternity is, you know, is, he's, he knows our beginning and he knows our end. And uh, so that is, and, that, and that's what, and I think this, am, am, I, am I fulfilling God's plan for me? Uh, and if I'm not, or if I don't think I am, what do I have to do to change? And to, and to, to as I say, to act with a sense of urgency. Whatever that might be, so that, that's why, uh, and that's why you know we have confession is the the chain sacrament, right? And it's uh, so it, uh, it you are you cannot walk out of the confessional without being transformed or changed. 
and uh, whether you feel it or, or it, it, you know, but it, it's it's a fact. So it's uh, and and that's because uh, you know, we've we've talked about if you if you have a uh, something that uh, for for years, right? For I can I say for many years, and and no matter how many years that you you're trying to kind of uh, tame this particular sin, the only way to do it is, you know, through frequent confession. Very similar to what you said, I had the same thing. I've always had God in the background, but the sense of urgency comes up. I just kept putting Whoa. off and putting off. And uh, you really, it's, it's a free will thing. You know when the time for you to do is to do. Uh, Monsignor O'Connor had mentioned this, and I put it in my note the first year I went through this. I love the quote. I'm not sure where it comes from. But it's accept what is, surrender what was, and look forward to what will be. And it's, it's really great. If you think of the woman from, uh, uh, from Samaria, that was a message that went viral. She had the message, she gave it to two people, she gave it to four people who continued going viral, they hosted Jesus, and the message has been carried throughout the world. So that's, the time was there, but it was the right time, the place was the right place, and uh, the word spread. Any questions? Does everybody understand the story? But it fascinated me when I read it. And there, there's so many... So this story is towards the end of his... Well, this is book four, so it's... Well, it's chapter four, so, yeah, so it occurred. Yeah, it's... So it's, many of the miracles already occurred. Well, so, uh, some of them, you know, uh, have occurred. So uh, Jesus had a name for himself. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm not putting it... He had already had quite a quite a following already, right? Uh, doing miracles and, and everything else, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, he's in his public ministry, so I think this is relatively towards the beginning oh. of the public ministry. And uh, because, you know, we haven't, he didn't, we didn't get to, uh, like, the sixth chapter of John is, you know, the discourse on, on the Eucharist, and so a lot, there's a lot. So this it's lady really had a lot of faith then because Jesus didn't have a name for him. I mean, he didn't, his name wasn't out there like all over, like, uh, right? Uh, no, she was, she was, from her personal meeting with him, I think what was probably well expressed in the story was he knew her. And he knew her without even meeting her. Mm -hmm. And he, he was just aware of what her sins were and what she was capable of being. And that's what I walked away with it as. Again, it's it's an interesting story. I took a class uh, one time, and it's you know it kind of remind reminds me of this story. It was a um, a Christian weight loss class, and it was called the Weight Down Workshop. And um, this southern woman, she had like uh, eight weeks of tapes and workbooks. And the whole premise of the class was when you have hunger for food and you're not really hungry, it's a spiritual hunger. And so the whole class was, you know, each one of these things were geared to make us see that and just self-discovery like that. And, um, and the, uh, the final class, you know, the weight loss was called the promised land. How did you do? So, <laughs> I lost <laughs> a couple. <laughs> uh, that's great. It's, it's interesting because as we were talking you before... Now. Now. They give you now. <laughs> as we were talking before with the accident, God nor, won't put more on your plate than you can handle. It's <coughs> also the reverse. God will give you as much as you can handle. And it's in faith and other matters. So, uh, so uh, 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 this uh, this story is uh, gospel appears uh, during Lent, and appears actually in the uh, cycle A readings. But if we were uh, is, and is often used with uh, 
when, uh, with celebration of the, uh, the scrutinies for those that are, are preparing for baptisms on, and on the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays of Lent, the three Gospels of the uh, woman at the well, the man born blind, and the raising of Lazarus are used because uh, they, they speak they speak uh, loudly about uh, you know about the, the experience of, of the encounter with Christ and the transformation and that's what's happening to the persons preparing for baptism so so what uh, and this is what uh, and really and it's what kind of should be happening to us during Lent so so the question is, is how, how is your Lent going? How is your Lent going? How would, how would you describe your, your Lenten experience so far? Is it, you, uh, you, you've set certain expectations at the beginning of Lent. Would you say that you're, you're, you're meeting those expectations or you feel that you, you need to... Uh, to step it up a notch. I think everybody probably step it feels up it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I didn't uh, give up donuts for Lent. Uh, I'm going to be entirely honest. I am meeting the expectation that I set because I did not set an expectation. So, but uh, I probably should have. I don't know if I could count the donuts. I mean, I've been, yeah, but, I've been on board with no donuts for a while now, so I think. But, so. Uh, but, but yeah, so, but the, uh, you know, one, one thing I, I thought uh, was trying to be more creative, mm -hmm. and uh, there's some, some creative things you can do uh, during Lent, uh, and in terms of uh, that, you know, you could give this up, give that up, that's, and, uh, but, but how about, uh, like, things like, well, can I do something good for somebody this day, right? And and what what uh, and and, and the, the, like uh, as an example, if one uh, as an example. So I and I can't say that I I may not have hit all the days, but uh, so we're in uh, Glenn and I in the line at uh, Costco, right? And uh, so the man comes up with uh, one item behind me. So I said, you go first, right? So I told Glenn, this is my good deed for the day. <laughs> so, so simple thing, right? Simple thing. And, uh, and, 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 and it's not, you know, or maybe you, uh, or maybe you bit your tongue and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and you chose your words carefully in a, in, in a conversation or, or you chose, you, you, you held back the uh, the ammo, <laughs> right? You kept it in in the arsenal, <laughs> or uh, and and th these these are these are I think these these are kinds of things are 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 not only good for Lent, but you know to to the to the course. So, because uh, you know if well it can be difficult to give up something, uh, but but it's sometimes you these other things. I say what I call the be creative. What do, they, what do they say? Acts of penance and charity. There's a certain term that. Yeah, we you actually we missed that when we the, the, the time we talked that Lent. I thought about it. We didn't talk about the big three, as the big three, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, right? Mm -hmm. And the uh, and that uh, and like we said, fasting without prayer is nothing but a weight loss program. That's right. That's all it is. And so, so, uh, so they're, they're all uh, inter interrelated. So, so fasting, uh, fasting is is fasting from maybe being negative, right? Fasting from, I say, fasting from using your tongue to to uh, you know to cut somebody down, or or uh, or 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 also you you can. And, and and the same way, almsgiving isn't always about money, but you can you can give your kind words, right? As an example, I'm uh, in, in the uh, in the wellness center. Those of you who belong to, to to Robert Wood, in in the wellness center, the uh, you know the, the maintenance man is uh, 
painting in, in the men's uh, locker room. So, so I told him, I said, did, did anyone ever tell you you do nice work? He said, well, no one ever told me that, you know? <laughs> so uh, so, uh, so it's, it's the little things, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, and to be, to be on the lookout, to, to be on the lookout for, uh, to, you know, because for to, to make building building people up and rather than you know chopping them down and so all these these things I, I think to me they're just creative things to do during Lent so you can still eat the Boston cream donuts <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, oh so so yeah so uh, and and to say well the thing is if if you haven't started or if you have started and you and you say well. I'm a disaster, or right. I'm not. I'm not meeting. The, it's okay. You know. You uh, to start again. You, and and the thing is, you don't have to do the same thing throughout the whole course of Lent. You know. You mix it up, right? Today, I'll give up uh, Boston cream donuts, right? Or this week, next week, uh, maybe it'll be the uh, the, the Persians there, <laughs> whatever, right? So. Uh, but uh, everyone knows that's a Persian, right? This, this, so, this so, one, so we're going to Persian. See, this, you, got, you, you need to spend more time in pinhos if you don't notice. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to spend some time on uh, uh, Palm Sunday, uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter before before yeah, the, there before. is a uh, there's a, a class on the Triduum, I believe. I, it's, what what week is the class on the Triduum? It's the uh, March thirteenth. We talk. Well, you know, we talk. We talk about Passion Sunday, Easter, Joy Individual. So that that's where we can talk about the Triduum. We are going to discuss like Holy Thursday. Yeah, there's not, there's not a favorite, lot of classes left. So my favorite day. Yeah. Or my favorite. Not a holiday, but my favorite time in church. We meet after Easter too, don't we? Yeah, we, yeah, we, yes, we had, had uh, that's called Mr. Goji. That, the, so this is party this, day. It's not Mr. Goji, it's Mr. Goji. <laughs> that's party day. Well, yeah, yeah, so that's the, that's the period of post that we see the sacraments. So, so you, you can all be glowing. You can have this, this glow. They're coming here glowing. Right, and, uh, uh, or po uh, possibly. <laughs> but, and uh, so yeah, and then we talk about uh, about the journey, right? The uh, you know uh, what what happens now after the sacrifice. Like I said, this was my first time uh, really delving into the story. So if I fell short, no. no. I got uh, oh, got a video. Bishop Bell, oh, yeah. who is fantastic, and he brings everything into it down to earth. Uh, and this is... Well, about two weeks ago, I had the great privilege of going to Rome to be part of a jubilee celebration for priests as part of the Year of Mercy. And so I addressed all the English-speaking priests who were there, and they were from all over the world. They're from you know, states and Canada, from England, Ireland, from Holland, from Latvia, from the Cameroon, Ghana. I met priests from all over the place. We gathered in this wonderful church of um, San Andrea de la Valle, which is right in the heart of Rome. And it was a great experience to be with these priests and to speak to them. And what I um, chose as my text was the woman at the well, the great story from chapter four of the Gospel of John. And I drew four uh, kind of insights out of that story about the divine mercy. Here's the first one. The divine mercy is relentless. Very important thing to know. The divine mercy is after us. I know I've said it a million times in different forums, but the Bible is not the story of our quest for God. Our quest for God is just not that interesting. It's true, it's valid, but it's not that interesting. What's really interesting is God's quest for, quest for us. God's after us. God's mercy is coming after us. Now, how do you see it in the story? Well, Jesus going into Samaria, right? So he begins in Judea in the south. He's going up to Galilee in the north. Most pious Jews would have gone around Samaria because it was unclean. It was the land of the, of the half-breeds, right? So pious Jews went around it. Jesus goes into it. 
That's the first thing. He's he's after the marginalized, the half breeds, the the uh, the forgotten, the uh, all that. He he's after us. He's going uh, over the boundaries that we set. More to it, um, he's a Jew talking to a Samaritan. He's a man talking to a woman. That was also unheard of in a public forum. And then finally, the woman who comes at noon and alone to fetch water. Well, that's weird because you wouldn't come at the hottest time of the day. You'd come at the morning or the end of the day, and you'd come with other people. It was like a, a festive public event. Why is she coming at the worst time of the day and alone? Well, we find out, of course, she's a public sinner. Jesus doesn't care. He crosses that boundary too, and he reaches out to her. There's the first thing we need to know, I told the priest. And this Pope Francis is all over this thing. God's mercy is relentless. Go back to uh, one of my spiritual heroes, Thomas Merton, you know, who said the principal problem in religion is the Promethean problem. Right? So Prometheus in the great myth steals fire from the gods, and the gods are angry, and they arrest him, and they punish him eternally. Because God and humanity on that reading are rivals. Right? We have to steal things from God because God doesn't want to give them to us. That's not the Bible. That's not the Bible. God has no need of the world. God's not trying to protect something from the world. Everything I have is yours, right? Says the father of the, of the of older brother in the prodigal son story. Look, pal, you don't have to be grabbing it from me. You don't got to be my slave to get it. Everything I have is yours. Don't you get that yet? That's the relentlessness of God's mercy, which overcomes the Promethean problem. Okay. Well, the second theme I uh, drew out of the story is that the divine mercy is divinizing. Sometimes we think the divine mercy is merely uh, sanative, by which I mean that it, it heals us of what's wrong with us. You know, it's, it solves the problem of sin, which indeed it does. But see, there's more to it than that, because the divine mercy wants to draw us into the dynamics of the divine life. God wants to share his life with us. Go back to the prophet Isaiah, who says uh, something I think it's breathtaking the more you think about it. Your builder wants to marry you, Isaiah says. Well, your builder means God, the one that's built you into existence. And what does he want to do now? Let me get this straight. He doesn't want to just, you know, dominate you or give you the law or have you obey him or something, which all the religions would say. No, no, he wants to marry you. Well, see, what's marriage? But it's the sort of neck plus ultra metaphor for intimacy. If you're a poet and you're, and you're reaching for what, what, what's the greatest kind of intimacy, intellectual, physical, sexual, psychological, what would I reach for? I'd reach for marriage, right? It's a sharing of life. That's what God wants. God wants to marry us. I, I think most even biblical people don't think along those lines. That's what God finally wants to accomplish. Well, now watch, watch, watch in the story of the woman at the well. If you're stopping by a well and you're a biblical person, you're automatically thinking marriage. Now why? Well, look where um, Abraham sends people to find a wife for Isaac, and they stop by a well, and that's where they find uh, his wife. Uh, Jacob finds his wife by a well. Moses sits down by a well, and then Zipporah, his wife, comes. And so Israelite people, when they said heard well, they're thinking, oh, this is a marriage situation. Well, here's a man sitting down at a well with a woman. Well, St. Augustine said wonderfully that the woman here, the Samaritan woman, symbolizes the church. What's the church, mind you? It's the bride of Christ, who's the bridegroom. And so this is a kind of trysting place, this well. Now, what's Jesus doing? He says to her, now, give me a drink. And she balks, you're a man and a Jew asking me, a Samaritan and a woman, for a drink? Oh, if you knew who was asking you, you'd ask him, and he'd give you living water. See, this is spiritual physics, right? What John Paul II called the law of the gift which is that your being increases in the measure that you give it away. It's the fundamental law of the spiritual life. We all think the opposite. My being increases the more I hang on to things. Right? Give it to me, let me hang on to it. But the divine life, what I really want to be filled with is God, right? God is love. Therefore, to be filled with love is to be filled with self-gift. As God gives me, I give that gift away, and then I get more of the divine life, which I then give away, and I get more of the divine life. And in that great rhythm, I become a participant in the divine life. That's how my builder comes to marry me. That's the divinizing quality of the divine mercy. 
now welcome to the sacraments and to the mass and to confession and to the Eucharist. All of it is meant to be a participation in this divine life. So there's the second point. Third point, I think very important today, by the way, that the divine mercy is demanding. We fall very easily today into a zero-sum game, which is the more I stress the divine mercy, well, then the less I must stress the divine demand. If I say mercy, mercy, mercy all day, then I should mute demand. No, no, no. That's silly. That's a zero-sum, non-biblical, non-Christian logic. Chesterton had it right, right? With the great both and logic of Christianity. Jesus is fully divine and fully human. And that logic sort of uh, invades the whole of our thinking. As he said, we like red, we like white, we have a healthy hatred of pink. We like both colors in their in their integrity. So Mercy, mercy, mercy. Yes, all the way. You can never say it too much. You can never say it too much. But mercy and demand, and moral demand. Now, where do we see it here? St. Augustine said wonderfully that the well to which the woman comes every day symbolizes concupiscent desire. That just means errant desire. It means spiritually dysfunctional desire. So the well, I come to fill myself up to be happy with wealth and honor and privilege and power and so on. We all have a version of it, right? So everybody watching this video, everybody, me included, we all got a version of this. There's something we go to and we drink and we get a little bit of satisfaction, but then we're thirsty again. And so we come back and we come back in this desperate rhythm that gets us nowhere finally. Isn't that precisely what Jesus says to the woman at the well? You come every day to this well, don't you? You drink and you get thirsty again. I want to give you water bubbling up in you to eternal life. See, there's the divinizing quality. But the demand he's making is you got to get rid of this rhythm that you're in. You got to stop coming to this stupid well and you got to come to the water I want to give you. And then he, I love how he presses it and how beautifully he, he builds up to this point. He doesn't begin with this. That'd be dysfunctional. But listen to what he says. Call your husband. And she, she's now at home with him. She's comfortable. She goes, well, I don't have a husband. That's right. You've had five. And the one you're with now is not your husband. Boy, is he coming down hard on her. Boy, is he making a moral demand. Yes, he is. Precisely the one who said, mercy, mercy, mercy. Relentless, non-Promethean. Share the divine life. Builder wants to marry you. All that remains true. Totally. And, and, Therefore, I'm making a demand on you. Therefore, you got to let go of things that are blocking the flow of the divine life in you. And so, everyone listening to this video, you know, uh, I can't overstate the divine mercy. I don't want to. Mercy, 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 all day and all night and all the next day. But that implies demand. It, it implies change. So Jesus calls us to metanoia, right, to conversion. The question is, what's the well? Right? What is the well? Name it. Name it. You've all got one. I've got one. Or two or three. What are they? And get rid of them. You know, uh, Respond to the divine mercy that way. Final point, the fourth point, I told the priest, the divine mercy sends us on mission. And it's beautiful. You know, um, In the Bible, as I've said many times, nobody has ever given an experience of God without being sent. Nobody. There's no exception. Old Testament and New. No one ever experiences God without being sent. And so this woman, we hear, after speaking to Jesus, puts down the water jar, and then she goes into the city and she announces Christ. She becomes the first evangelist, right, in the Gospel of John. Very important uh, position. The water jar that she puts down, what does that symbolize? That's the conversion. She puts down this old addictive pattern. She puts it down. I'm through with that. I'm not doing that anymore. Unless we can identify what is the water jar, what's the well that you keep going back to, and unless you're willing and able to put that thing down, you're not there yet. But once you do, what do you become automatically? An evangelist. She goes to tell the, the town, what? Let me tell you about this guy who's told me everything I've ever done. It's a very, very interesting thing. Not literally. He didn't, he didn't tell her, ever, but he cracked the code of her life, didn't he? He cracked the code. He did tell her everything she's ever done because he, he uncovered the dynamic. You've been running these stupid wells all your life. That's your problem. And so she, she understood that. She was transformed by him. 
So she wants to tell other people about him. Which leads me to uh, my favorite definition of evangelization, which is one beggar telling another beggar where there's bread. See, and if we get that, then we will evangelize. If we're simply doing a head trip, you know, let me tell you about facts about Jesus. Let me tell you truths about Jesus. I mean, fine, fine. That's not real evangelization. Real evangelization comes from people who have put down the water jar under the influence of the divinizing mercy of Christ and now want to tell the world about it. They're beggars too, but they found where the bread is and they want other people to know. So those are the four things I told the uh, priests in Rome. And can I ask everyone watching this video, um, say a prayer for those guys. I think uh, I can see them now, the 700 priests gathered there. There were about 5,000 priests came from all over the world, different you know, countries and languages. Say a prayer uh, for these priests, that they might be um, announcers and bearers of the divine mercy. Can you close with a prayer? Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of this day and this uh, season of Lent and this opportunity to uh, grow closer to you. And, uh, and, and as we journey through our lives, and, and uh, thank you for Irv's uh, presentation and, and sharing and sharing his faith and teaching us uh, about the story about the woman at the well and, uh, and in a special way. We, ask you for all the graces that we need uh, at this moment and whatever we're experiencing and, and uh, we know Jesus that uh, you're with us always and we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.